So in my first year of university, my college roommate invited me to go to a party off campus. Now, those of you who know me know I rarely pass up a good party, so I went with him. And we got to this house, and, and at the party, while we were out in the backyard, he offered me a can of chewing tobacco. Now, I had never done anything tobacco-related in my life. I had never smoked, never chewed, but I, again, I have a hard time saying no. So I was like, sure, what's the worst that could happen? More on that later. So he tells me, you know, as, as the juice comes out of the tobacco leaves, just spit that out. And I'm like, okay, I can do that. And at the very end, he spits his plug out and tells me to do the same thing. And a couple strands of tobacco is all that comes out. Now, some of you, I heard groaning because you probably know what's going to happen. I didn't. And he's like, where's the rest of it? And uh, I said, oh, I don't know. I, I must have swallowed some of the leaves. And he just looked at me with a look of pity. And he said, buddy, this is going to be a rough night for you. <laughs> so we went back into the house, and I'm sitting on a couch, and I start to feel a bit of churning in my stomach. And I realize that uh, the future is not looking too promising for me, and the hopelessness begins to set in. And I'm barely able to dash out of the house before I puke all over their backyard. And so I text my, my, my housemates on the inside, because I didn't know these people who, who, whose party it was very well, and I was like, guys, we got to get out of here, I got to go home. And so we start walking home, and I am just so sick. I'm throwing up on the sidewalk, on people's lawns. It's just, it's a mess, right? At one point, there was a lake close to our house, and I just laid on the dock with my head over the water for what seemed like hours and just, you know, gave the, the, the fish some free food, if you know what I mean. But when I finally get back to the house, because we had broken curfew to go to this party, the doors were all locked, and I'm like, can this night get any worse? Like, I have to, now I just want to crawl into bed and, and just pretend this night never happened. So I have to walk all the way across town. I'm sick there too. And I, even the next morning, I was sick. And I was like, am I ever going to get better? Like, did I mess myself up completely forever? And I just realized, like, this one decision, it messed up not just the party, but the whole night and a good chunk of the rest day. I swore I would never, ever, ever touch chewing tobacco ever again. And, and I realized that this mistake, it had consequences that just kept spiraling out of control. And I tell you the story because I wonder, have you ever felt that your life was going out of control? That because of one misstep, you've wrecked your future going forward. Maybe you believe that you have permanently ruined your life because of some decision, some mistake in your past that has irreversible consequences and that you constantly live in the shadow of. Maybe it's not so much what you've done, but what someone has done to you that makes you doubt that your life will ever be able to go back to the way that it was. And you say things to yourself like, you know, I'm just not set up for a good life. My family is just too dysfunctional. I'll, I'll never be able to get that friend back. Or that employer, he, when he passed me over, he really messed up my life. It's just so unfair. Or maybe nothing has happened to you. Yet. But you're anxious all the time and you feel like if I just make one false step, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to screw my life up. The future is so precarious and I, I don't want to step out of line and do something that would inadvertently wreck my future. And some of you are thinking, well, Father Isaac, I wasn't anxious about anything coming into Mass, <laughs> but I sure am now. Right? Now I'm afraid of everything. Aren't you supposed to comfort us from up there or something? Well, for us as Christians, what we do is we sometimes we take these anxieties about our future and we put them on our view of God. And we think things like, well, my life is so messed up that not even God could fix this. Or it's my responsibility to make sure that my life is on track so that I don't let God down. Maybe some of you have thought these things. And the thing is, when we, when we actually apply this to God in this way, we limit him. We make uh, too small of a view of God. And that's why we're beginning this new series now called Big God. 
in which we're going to dive into the Scriptures to see the truth of just how big our God is. Often our view of God is very small. It's very shallow, limited, even boring sometimes. People's view of God can be boring. But the truth is is that God is far bigger than what we imagine him to be. And that this big God actually wants to have a relationship with us to have direct action in our lives. The scriptures today are very clear that God is bigger than our human capacity to mess things up. Think about what happens with Adam and Eve in our story today. God creates them in this paradise garden. There's no sickness, there's no death, there's no pain. It's perfection. But when they listen to the tempting lies of the serpent, they eat the fruit from the tree that God warned them not to eat from, and as a result, they wreck this perfect harmony. They introduce death and sin and pain and suffering into the world. The innocence, the closeness that they had with God is lost, and they're forced out of the garden. And not just them, but all of their descendants are cursed as a result of their rebellion. And the the relationship between humanity and God is wounded. I'm not exaggerating when I say this was the most tragic the most cataclysmic moment in human history. This was the great fall of our race. And there was really a feeling that the devil had won, that the serpent had won. Imagine the guilt and the shame that Adam and Eve would have been feeling. Like we allowed ourselves to be tricked. We fell away from God. And as a result, all of our children now, the whole of humanity has this future of doom. There's no turning back. There's no way to recover what was lost. But in this moment of utter loss, of utter hopelessness, God speaks to the serpent. And the words that he says will reverberate through the rest of history. This is what God says to the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. It's pretty cryptic words. I'm sure Adam and Eve might have been scratching their heads thinking, what what is God saying? What does that mean? Maybe some of you are in that same boat. You're like, yeah, I'm with Adam and Eve. I'm not entirely sure what God is saying here. Well, he's saying that in time, one of Eve's descendants will come, and the snake will will strike at this descendant's heel. But ultimately, he will have victory over the serpent by striking at his head. And in time, this descendant did come. And his name was Jesus. Because Jesus, fully God, was also fully man, which means he truly was a descendant, the offspring of Adam and Eve, our first parents. And he would go to the cross where his heel would be pierced by a nail. The serpent would strike at the heel of Christ. But it was in the moment of his death on the cross that Jesus would deal the ultimate death blow to the serpent and crush his head. Adam and Eve had seemingly messed up humanity's future beyond repair. But God, in his greatness, was able to take what the serpent had meant for evil and turn it around to bring about the redemption of the entire human race. And in this, God shows how big he really is, that he is bigger than the whole of human history, that God is not powerless in the face of our human freedom, basically meaning that none of our mistakes can cause his plan to go off track, while at the same time, he's not this kind of cosmic puppeteer moving us here on earth. He leaves us truly free. And yet, his overall plan is never thwarted by our actions. He's so big that he's able to bring great good out of our worst mistakes. And this should be very comforting for you. Because just like God is able to direct the whole of human history, he is able to direct your own history, your own life, without limiting your freedom. So if there's a moment where you think, My life, my future, it's ruined. I have really good news for you. 
God is bigger than your ability to mess things up. God is bigger than your ability to mess things up. He's bigger than the ability of other people to mess your life up. If someone has hurt you, has damaged your life in some way, you don't need to believe that your future is wrecked because of that. God is able to turn things around. He's big enough to do that. And this can be a source of real peace and joy because if you have surrendered your life to God, your future now is in his hands. You can rest in the peace of knowing that as long as you are seeking to do his will, that you're striving to follow his plan, he will direct your life according to his perfect will. And even though at certain points in your life it might seem like things are going off the rails, those are moments for an invitation to even greater trust. To say, God, my life is yours, and I trust that you will be able to bring a good about that I can't see right now. Now, I want to tell you the story of someone whose life seemed to be ruined, who seemed to have no hope for the future, and yet God was able to bring great good out of her hopeless situation, and her name is St. Josephine Bakita. St. Josephine Bakita. Maybe you've heard of her before. I can't tell you the full story of her life or else I'd have you trapped here for another 20 minutes, right? And my homilies are long enough, amen? But if you are interested in learning the fullness of her life, um, there's a really great podcast that I could suggest to you about the lives of the saints. Uh, and it's mine, you know? It's just, just shameless self-promotion, like, I have no shame. I'm just using you to boost my numbers, right? But, but seriously, if you're interested in learning about her life in its fullness, you can go to Heroes of the Faith and download the episode on her life because it's truly amazing what God has done in her. But she was born in 1869 in the country of Sudan. And when she was only eight years old, she was kidnapped by Arabic slave traders and sold into slavery. This little eight-year-old girl. And she was brutally treated. She was beaten. She was was horribly abused. And she was eventually sold to an Italian owner who took her back to Italy. And it was here in Italy for the very first time that she met Christians. Specifically, she met a group of nuns who told her about Jesus, who told her about the faith. She had never heard of it before in her time in Africa. And she was captivated by this Jesus that the nuns told her about, and she wanted to become baptized. But her master was going back to live in Africa, and he wanted to take his slave with him. But the nuns intervened. Never mess with a group of nuns, right? (laughs) So they got the church involved. They they started this whole court case to fight for Paquita's freedom, and eventually the court Uh, decreed that she was no longer a slave and she could do whatever she wanted. And what she wanted to do with her newfound freedom is to become baptized. She took the name Josephine and she actually joined the same convent of nuns that had befriended her and told her about the Lord. Now clearly, Bakita in her life, she endured horrific abuse, kidnapping, slavery, torture, uh, and she endured a lot of stress. I mean, imagine going through a trial where you're not sure if you're going to be a slave or free by the end of it. And in that moment, I'm sure, all she could think about was the pain of what she was going through and wondering, is there any hope for me? What is my future going to be? But God was able to use all of this to bring about this opportunity for her to meet him. And Bakita herself, she said this amazing quote when she was asked later on about her time in slavery. She said, if I were to meet the slave traders who kidnapped me, and even those who tortured me, I would kneel and kiss their hands. For if that did not happen, I would not be a Christian and religious today. That's powerful. That, that's powerful. Can you see the greatness of our God working in the life of this woman? that even though horrible things were done to her that would ruin anyone's life, God is still able to direct her to a beautiful future. 
And only in hindsight, by looking back on her life, is she able to see his design working to bring about this greater good out of the evil she endured. And so today, what if we all imitated her? What if we imitated Bikita in her trust in God despite the circumstances that we find ourselves in? What if today you made the decision to entrust your life to this big God? And if there's something in your life where in your prayer time maybe it bubbles to the surface that there's a fear about your future, a fear that you've destroyed your life because of a mistake or what someone else has done to you. If something comes to the surface, I invite you to invite God into that, to entrust that specifically to him. And to say, God, you are bigger than my past. God, I trust you with my future. That you have the final say over where my life is headed. I entrust my life to you today, God. All of my anxieties, all of my regrets, I give them over to you, trusting that you will bring a good that I can't see right now. Because nothing you've done, nothing that has been done to you, has the final say over your future. God does. Entrust your life to him today. Let him guide you according to his plan. And you will rest secure in the hands of our big God.